हेलो एवरीबडी एंड आई एम डॉक्टर साधना गुप्ता सर फॉक्सी एट वेरियस नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल फोरम एंड टुडे वी विल डिस्कस प्री इक्लैम्शिया इमर्जिंग कंसेप्ट एंड सॉल्यूशन टू चैलेंजेस सो आई ओ अ बिग थैंक्स टू एवरीबडी फॉर बींग टूगेदर इन माई जर्नी एंड आई ब्रिंग रीटिंग फ्रॉम सिटी ऑफ लॉर्ड बुद्धा एंड ही सेज वी कैन नेवर ऑफ्टेन पीस इन द आउटर वर्ल्ड अंटिल वी मेक पीस विद आवर सेल्स सो वी वॉन्ट ऑलवेज टू सेव मदर्स लाइफ एवरी वेयर एंड मिनिमाइज द क्रिटिकलिटी एज वेल सो वॉट इज प्री इक्लेम्शिया इट इज ए ट्रबलिंग इट इज ए सम कॉम्प्लिकेशन विच कैन हैव वेरीड प्रेजेंटेशन एंड कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट टू सबस्टेंशियल नंबर ऑफ मैटर्नल क्रिटिकलिटी एंड मॉर्टेलिटी सो it is still mystic and mysterious we don't know why some women have preeclampsia and toxemia of pregnancy what we call so a lot of name we owe to this hypertensive disorder of pregnancy that is called preeclampsia it may be preeclampsia eclampsia hdp gestosis and the toxemia of pregnancy so why it is so important to have the full knowledge as well as the ground level good health care to them uh, with the good clinical practice because it is affecting 3 to 5% of pregnancy and responsible for around 500000 fetal and neonatal death and more than 70000 maternal death so hypertensive disorder of pregnancy is coming as a first two cause or somewhere or only at the first cause for the maternal mortality and women in low resource countries where india is also there we are women are at high risk for developing preeclampsia so right in india in 2017 we lost around 35000 mother and it is a great important is that all obstetrician and gynecologist as well as the healthcare provider have the adequate knowledge and the skill to deal with it it is not only short term complication but it has a long term shadow on the women as well as the children life because the women who have preeclampsia have the higher chances for developing metabolic disorder in later life and they will have the recurrence of preeclampsia in the subsequent pregnancy and a very very important thing that the fetus the children born to these mother have again the higher chance of having the metabolic disorder that is hypertension as well as the learning and the neurocognitive issue so with this that uh, this disease is a one of the important obstetrical challenge and affecting short term and the long term health of mother as well as the children uh, who are born to these preeclamptic mother we have to be very clear in our knowledge so when we term that this woman is having preeclampsia or hypertensive disorder of pregnancy so when uh, the blood pressure is more than 140 by 90 mm of hg then we considered that this woman is having hypertensive disorder of pregnancy but how to take this decision how to take blood pressure reading this is very very important especially when our opd are crowded and have a good number of patient they because the blood pressure has to be taken in right position that is sitting or left lateral position after 20 week with appropriate size cuff and the calibrated is sphygmomanometer the reading should be taken at least 4 hours apart so this is very important that the right position of blood pressure with right size of cuff is important then our blood pressure instrument should be calibrated so mercury sphygmomanometer has a got so few environmental issues so we are having automatic electronic or aneroid important thing that we must have one or two at least mercury sphygmomanometer and they should be always calibrated with the mercury blood pressure instrument white coat hypertension when women is having blood pressure at clinic not at home masked hypertension normal at clinic but sometime elevated at other times so uh, today we are having mostly aneroid or automatic bp instrument uh, but important thing is that we must have at least one or two mercury sphygmomanometer so they can be calibrated with the uh, the standard mercury sphygmomanometer now the woman can have white coat hypertension that the she is having elevated bp at office normal at home masked hypertension normal at clinic but sometime it is a occasional high reading and delta hypertension when there is a sudden rise in mean arterial pressure but still in normal range so this is important that uh, 
uh, that even the woman with white coat mass or delta hypertension can have preeclampsia and hypertensive disorder and they should always be advised for regular blood pressure measurement. So I emphasize that the correct assessment of blood pressure is very very important and around 140 by 90 is the time then we consider this patient as a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. Early versus late onset preeclampsia we have to define because they are the different type of disorder. So early onset preeclampsia is proteinuric hypertension occurring before 34 week of gestation and it is a fetal disorder that is typically associated with placental dysfunction, oligohydromnios, IUGR and the compromised Doppler study. While the late onset hypertension or the preeclampsia, the hypertension occurs after 34 week and it is considered a maternal disorder due to underlying constitutional factor. They have usually not associated with IUGR or the oligohydromnias, they have a normal or the large placental volume, normal Doppler studies and they have the more uh, favorable maternal and neonatal outcome. So uh, how to classify hypertensive disorder of pregnancy? This is important. Gestational hypertension when the hypertension develop after 20 week it is gestation not associated with proteinuria. Preeclampsia hypertension with proteinuria but proteinuria is now not considered mandatory for the diagnosis. So it is when there is any organ dysfunction like liver function, liver dysfunction, kidney dysfunction, platelet count then we consider that it is a diagnosis of the preeclampsia. So proteinuria is there as a mean for the diagnosis but not necessarily it is it should be present any sign of organ dysfunction is with hypertension is considered preeclampsia. Chronic hypertension, uh, hypertension when it was there before 20 week of pregnancy and persist after delivery. So sometime when the patient comes in the second trimester, we can have a normal reading because of the physiological peripheral vasodilatation and that have to be differentiated from gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. Super, superimposed preeclampsia when severe hypertension and proteinuria in chronic hypertension is associated with the preeclampsia, superimposed preeclampsia. So hypertensive patient developing organ dysfunction and the proteinuria eclampsia when the patient has the fit and again I emphasize that the proteinuria we are not always it is a standard teaching 24 hour urinary protein but actually in practicality it is not possible so we have to rely on to the urine dipstick test and that plus 2 positive urine protein is considered the surrogate marker that this patient is having the proteinuria. So again I emphasize that proteinuria is a essential part of diagnosis but not mandatory for diagnosis of preeclampsia. Evidence of maternal acute kidney injury, liver dysfunctional, neurological feature, hemolysis or thrombocytopenia. We have any of these then we consider it is a preeclampsia if it is associated with high blood pressure reading. Now severe versus non-severe classification it is important and we have to also differentiate that any time non-severe eclampsia preeclampsia can be converted into the present as a severe preeclampsia because it is a disorder which is affecting every part of the body every system of the body and uh, like from brain to the peripheral neuropathy, liver, kidney, hemolysis, coagulation. So this is very important. We still do not know what caused preeclampsia but inadequate placentation by trophoblast is the main important thing cause that cause endothelial dysfunction and abnormal angiogenesis, chronic inflammatory response with resultant vasoplasm, it is activation of platelet. So there is a micro thrombosis and then it cause consumption of platelet and the abnormal coagulation profile. Few new concepts are coming for the understanding of preeclampsia that is acute atherosis. So multiple form of decidual vascular stimulation, inflammation stimulation may cause acute atherosis. Uh, it is considered as a first stage and the second stage in classical teaching. So first stage is the shallow invasion of trephoblast which result into the inadequate modeling of a spiral artery and the second stage is the maternal response to endothelial dysfunction and imbalance. This cause the widespread manifestation of preeclampsia but in body actually the all things are going hand in hand and it also it only presents to us as a spectrum for the worsening disease. Uh, preeclampsia 
can occur with vesicular mole, it can occur with the secondary abdominal pregnancy and uh, it can, uh, the women have the genetic susceptibility, we have identified many genes who are the, like make the woman prone to preeclampsia and we have identified fetal gene also, though the fetus also control that this woman or mother can have the preeclampsia. So, it is an endothelial disorder and sometime it comes as a edema, uh, large uh, like uh, excessive weight gain because it is a manifestation of capillary leak and sometime preeclampsia present only as a oligohydromnias and the fetal growth restriction with abnormal lab test with multiple organ dysfunction. So, again I want the presentation of preeclampsia can be typical with hypertension, proteinuria, sometime edema. Edema is not considered as a diagnosis because we can have a physiological edema in many women and the, the manifestation of organ dysfunction and it can come as a, a typical form like a de novo postpartum hypertension, sudden conversion, conversion at the normal blood pressure and the oligohydromnias and the fetal growth restriction. This is a uh, placenta can be, uh, we say always the start of the preeclampsia is inadequate invasion of the trophoblast of spiral artery, but today this is a totally paradigm shift into the understanding that placenta is not villain but victim. So, what is a the suboptimal cardiovascular performance is more likely to cause poor placentation because of uteroplacental malperfusion. So, placental malperfusion occur because women the mother is not having the good cardiac performance and it is a when there is a excessive demand like twin pregnancy, multifetal pregnancy, it also causes the load on the cardiac system and that cause the and the preeclampsia susceptibility to preeclampsia. So, placenta is not a villain, but it is a victim that is a totally new understanding and it may have a future implication in future preeclampsia management. How we can predict and prevention? So, always we like it is such a important health issue that we have to work that can we see that this woman is going to have the preeclampsia in this pregnancy. So, what we have for everyone that is the maternal factor and the mean arterial pressure, we have to be very careful. So, uh, this is for universal and uterine artery Doppler whenever the patient woman is risk or some uh, at some setup they are doing the universal Doppler studies and the biomarkers. So, these are uh, uh, among biomarkers the PAPA associated plasma protein we can do when we are doing the genetic and nucleoide test and the PLGF examination that if there is a low PGF a woman is more prone to develop the preeclampsia. But the clinical scoring Actually, in our country for 27 million deliveries, it is so difficult to have the expertise in the Doppler studies and the biomarker, but the clinical thing which we can do for all. So, gestosis score which has been done by the Indian chapter of gestosis and Dr. Sanjay Gupte, Dr. Uh, Gorak has been the instrumental in it and you can take just a history that what is uh, the history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, BMI, IVF pregnancy, inter-pregnancy interval and if there is a score more than 3, this woman is having the more risk of developing preeclampsia and you can prescribe the preventive measure that is aspirin. Biomarker a lot lot of thing have been taught so placenta uh, PLGF is the thing which we are doing. The second is SFLT1 PLGF ratio. So, SFLT1 is a an pro-oxidant like a, it is a it is a marker of chronic inflammation and the PLGF which is a antioxidant. So, that ratio gives you idea that this woman is going to have the preeclampsia or not. So, for practical setting it is difficult but the importance of SFLT PLG ratio is that if it is altered, then it is says that women can have preeclampsia next 10 to 15 days, 7 to 10 days. But if it is normal, then it is the patient is not going to have preeclampsia in 7 to 10 days. It is workable in the second trimester also. So, when the patient is in a rural setting, she is not approachable to the, like she is not residing in area where the all care is available. This is a good test that when we want to refer the patient to the higher center. So, if it is 
and if in the SFLT uh, PLGF ratio it is a gestational specific uh, limit so if it is like pregnancy is likely to develop preeclampsia within 4 week if it is more than 38 so 38 value is important so we have the clinical profile Doppler studies biomarker biomarker among PLGF the reinterpretation of PAPA and SFLT and the PLGF ratio I just want to emphasize that the maternal factor and mean arterial pressure only can give you around 50 to 60 percent predictive rate and whenever you find that this woman is high risk you can go for the Doppler studies. Maternal fetal medicine has devised the FMF calculator as well. So, uh, the generation who is quite tax savvy, they can put the value and say what is the risk for the uh, preeclampsia for this particular woman. So, what we are there to do when we have detected that this woman is having high risk factor, then what we can do? So, the aspirin 150 milligram at night right from before 16 week preferably around 12 week to 36 to 37 week is the thing which can prevent preeclampsia in substantial number of cases. So, it is not going to prevent in all but it is considered that it has a helping role in the manifestation of the preeclampsia or reducing severity of the preeclampsia. So, this is a protocol for it, it is evidence based comprehensive prenatal screening how we can uh, like add the uh, genetic aneuploidy test with the scoring with the risk assessment for the preeclampsia test and many labs are doing it. So, important thing is the resource setting that it is not available and I again emphasize that take blood pressure well in every setting like appoint only the person who is well confident in the skill in taking blood pressure and the clinical profile that is the history and the clinical profile. So, it is uh, the plasperin is the thing which we can uh, have as a preventive role and the women who are having the low calcium intake the supplementation of calcium 1.5 to 2 gram elemental calcium after 20 week pregnancy in low intake population they can also prevent the preeclampsia. Should we recommend aspirin to all? No, the only in the risk patient who are having the risk factor for the preeclampsia. So, when we term severe and non-severe, so it is when it is a thrombocytopenia, renal insufficiency, liver involvement that the GOT, GPT is high, creatinine level more than 1.1, cerebral system, symptom, headache, visual disturbance, conversion, then we consider that it is a preeclampsia and severe and non-severe. So, this is important uh, more than 160 by 110 of blood pressure, proteinuria none too positive I emphasize it can be absent also, ominous sign present like headache, visual disturbance, upper abdominal pain, then the altered function uh, liver and the, uh, the kidney function that is higher creatinine value, higher serum uh, transaminase value and the low platelet count. The, and the early onset preeclampsia is considered severe preeclampsia. Why we are so much bothered about it? Because it can result into the life threatening maternal complication like pulmonary edema, myocardial infarction, stroke, ARDS, coagulopathy, renal failure and the intrauterine fetal death. Fetus can have a short term complication like oligohydromnus, IUGR, IUFD, preterm birth, non reassuring a fetal heart and fetus can have long term complication like cerebral palsy, low IQ, hearing loss, visual impairment, insulin resistant, diabetes mellitus and all metabolic disorder. So, what Indian Society of Hypertensive Disorder to 18 and 21 says that for a average clinician, the preeclampsia is preeclampsia. So, yes, for our clinical management, we know we have to differentiate between severe and non-severe. But every woman with preeclampsia need to be have a close follow-up because we never know that at what time point of time the non-severe preeclampsia become the eclampsia. So, how to manage it? It based on the severity, gestational age and what we want to achieve terminate or no pregnancy, terminate the pregnancy at right time. So, mother and newborn both are the healthy and in most of the situation the right time termination gives you with the antihypertensive and with the anti seizure prophylaxis we can have the good management. Always confirm by the test by the regular blood pressure monitoring that this patient is having preeclampsia. 
you can have a day care admission from like 5 to 6 hours so that you are getting the reports you are getting the repeated blood pressure reading and you define that this woman is having preeclampsia or she is not having preeclampsia if the patient is not able to like stay at hospital you can give her the like a option for the self home monitoring of the blood pressure as well and then counsel her that you have to have the close follow up and you have to come for the frequent visit. So what we want to do in daycare, weight measurement, quantification of proteinuria, blood function test, renal function test, liver function test, LDS, uric acid and coagulation studies not for all only in certain clinical setting. Fetal evaluation is very very important and you have to look first for the amniotic fluid and the fetal biometry. So if there is no IUGR, there is not much needed benefit from the Doppler study. But if it is intrauterine growth retardation, then Doppler studies are recommended. And especially the umbilical RT Doppler, which can be learned by every obstetrician and gynecologist as well as the average radiologist. And that gives you fair idea that when you have to terminate the fetus. So, important thing when IUGR is not settled, Doppler studies are not going to have much use but in setting of IUGR and especially when there is a gross IUGR fetal weight less than third percentile abnormal uterine Doppler, then it can cause the adverse obstetrical outcome. So, I will say if low diastolic flow, very close observation with the steroid priming, if a absent diastolic flow not later than 34 week and if it is a reverse diastolic flow then it is not termination of pregnancy not later than 32 week and after baseline evaluation you have to look for the, and always and always ask for the omnial symptom. Are you having headache? Are you having upper quadrant pain? Are you having any other like a malaise and the vomiting and so you have to ask and more the ominous symptom present the more chances that you have to decide for the early termination of delivery and you have to ask for it actually because patient sometimes does not say anything. So it is gestosis score which again emphasize persistent headache, vomiting, epigastric pain, uncontrolled hypertension, low oxygen saturation and altered value that is the sign that we have to Think for the termination of pregnancy early. Maternal eco chest x-ray brain imaging is considered whenever it is a situation like if the woman is having breathlessness or the ARDS like symptom then eco and chest x-ray and if neurological issue refractory conversion then the brain imaging. So important thing that you have to look for the omnia sign, you have to have a close repeated investigation. Sometimes patients say why it is important, why we are having every fourth day investigation, but these women really need that follow up. So mini pairs and the full pairs. So when to consider that you have to shift the patient for the termination of delivery in a good quality care setup. So mini pairs can be done by everybody like parity, this is clinical and full pairs with the all lab investigation but important thing that we don't want any complication life threatening to occur. This is a time of preventive and positive health. So we don't want eclampsia, we don't want ARDS, we don't want intrauterine fetal death. We have to intervene before all these complications occur. So it is a care plan that very early onset preeclampsia you may have to terminate uh, delivery not only for the benefit of patient but also for fetus because now we have a good NIQ care and more than 34 after stabilization deliver. So important thing now coming to the Caesar profile axis, so MAC self is drug of choice. This is one message I want to give, not epitoin, not phenytoin, not diazepam, not cocktail regime. MAC self with the MAC by trial has been proven very, very safe and it is the pre-charge reason that is the 20% solution of the 4 gram and the 10 gram in, uh, in 5 gram in each buttock followed by 5 gram intramuscular every 4 hour or 1 gram per hour IV. So this is the standard regime we have to to say do serum magnesium level required not required you have to look for the respiratory rate patellar reflex and amount of urine in last one hour so if four uh, more than 100 ml in last four hour all these things are present patient is fairly settled but if it is loss of patellar reflex decreased respiratory rate or less than 100 ml in last four hour you have to restrict the second dose you can so second dose is restricted and if there is overdose though it is very uncommon you have to have the oxygen in 
intubation facility and antidote that is 10 ml of 10 percent calcium gluconate. So, max cell prophylaxis in severe preeclampsia if you are so, opting for terminating of delivery thinking that it occur then it should be given for 24 hours and the how long that 24 hours after delivery or the last fit. Antihypertensive regime when there is more than 140 by 90 you have to give antihypertensive and when there is a severe hypertension like more than 160 by 110 you have to resort sometime to the parenteral antibiotic antihypertensive sorry. So, what are the drug of choice who have a rapid onset of action and the short duration of action. So, if there is sudden lowering of blood pressure, you can have the reversal of it. Why we want to treat hypertension? Because we want to avoid life threatening complication like congestive heart failure, myocardial ischemia, renal renal injury or failure, ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. So, these are what we want to target 15 to 25 percent reduction. What are the drug we have? The lobetalol and nifedipine is for our availability, very easy availability, hydrology not available, some institution available, but it is for the short term when there is a hypertensive crisis and for the refractory cases nitroprusside, nitroglycine and enalperil. Lobetalol selective beta blocker and it does not uh, compromise fetal perfusion. So, it is a very good drug and we can use 200 milligram TDS to maximum dose of 2400 milligram complication adverse effect are bradycardia and the contraindication is CCF, diabetes mellitus and bradycardia. Nifadipine you can start 10 milligram TDS or 20 milligram TDS never give sublingually it is always to give in orally. In eclamptic patient also you can give by the RIAS tube. So, lobetalol and the nifadipine are the drug which are with us they are quite effective but in resistant cases nitroprusside, nitroglycerin and the inapril can be given but it has to be given with the consultation with the physician. So, always look for the highest dose. Nicadipine is in our study and the few studies are needed that it will be effective tool as antihypertensive in preeclampsia or not. What antihypertensive not to be given? Are the ACE inhibitor, diuretic, beta blocker and calcium channel antagonist except nifadipine. Last few slides about the eclampsia. So, the management is same seizure prophylaxis, antihypertensive, but before that you have to look for airway, breathing and the circulation. So, lateral decubitus position, mouth gag and neck extraction, not to put lung, tongue blade to back giving oxygen 5 to 10, 8 to 10 liter and keeping the oxygen saturation more than 96 percent and IV access for the 65 to 80 ml per hour fluid. So, this is important that the first is stabilize the patient with nursing care, protect her tongue, protect lateral decrease, protect aspiration, maintain oxygen saturation. Sometimes you have to give short course of digipam so that patient is so irritable that you cannot put catheterize and the IV access. So, after that it is all max self same dose and the antihypertensive same dose. If there is recurrent conversion you can give 2 to 4 gram, but if it is very very resistant conversion you think that there can be some neurological damage and head imaging is considered. Never take the patient unstable to the OT room. So, today there is a common thing that as soon as the patient with severe pre eclampsia, eclampsia comes, they immediately do scissors, do scissors. So, important thing never do cesarean section in unstable, first stabilize. You can have fetal bradycardia deceleration, but as soon you resuscitate the patient with IV fluid, antihypertensive, and mag self, the fetal bradycardia is restored. So, do not take hasty decision, but it, it can be very, very risky to do cesarean section in unstable patients. So, this is very important thing. Help is the in self is a manifestation of severe preeclampsia. We can have various categories 1, 2 and 3 and patient with full health syndrome more chances that you have to terminate. We can have the platelet count even low after postpartum. This is important. But today ISSP says that help does not mean the it is just a severe manifestation of preeclampsia, management is the same and the timely termination is the key. So, this is I want to uh, revisit and this is the emerging concept. Sometimes this patient can have hemorrhage, 
due to the high blood pressure eicosprene heparin b also do so it is also might be adding subcapsular liver hematoma is a life threatening emergency but important thing we are not going to deal with it but important thing always look for the epigastric pain vomiting and look for the liver in ultrasound so that we can anticipate that it is liver complication whenever you want to transfer transfer with first dose of maxself antihypertensive all uh, like abc the control of airway and organize care with the assistant with the some person from hospital and with all the good record what you have done uh, always when to deliver the baby is very very important question so for preeclampsia not more than 37 week but if there are progressive deterioration of any organ dysfunction this is time that you induce the labor so never before around 36 37 week good time but if it is a compromised doppler study so absent diastolic flow it is 34 week reverse diastolic flow it is 32 week you are giving maxself anyway for neuroprotection and the steroids are indicated for the steroid priming Caesarean section is not the only way so that I want to emphasize more near to term you can have achieved the vaginal delivery in majority of the cases with preeclampsia you can induce but have a low throat of caesarean section when severe FGR compromised blood flow or any obstetrical indication when you are inducing these patient the continuous monitoring is very very important have a watch on the fluid therapy that is 65 to 80 ml per hour oral antihypertensive control of blood pressure and never over fluid no over gelous fluid therapy because these women cannot tolerate the excessive fluid therapy and more prone to develop the pulmonary edema spinal and regional anesthesia is safer choice general anesthesia only considered when the coagulopathy or the low platelet count less than 70,000 or 80,000 so this is very important always give meticulously the MTSL you can give oxytocin 10 unit intramuscular or sometime carbitocin always because why it is important because these patient have restricted intravascular volume they cannot tolerate over fluid therapy what we do in PPH and they cannot tolerate the blood loss as well always look for the fetal outcome histopathology of the placenta and when the postpartum period is there I emphasize that these women should be kept for 36 to 72 hours in the ICU because they can develop severe hypertension, ARDS, postpartum hemorrhage, neurological complications. So never shift these patients to the normal ward. Every nurse, every junior doctor should knowing that this patient need close monitoring and repeat investigation after two days and you can discharge on five days but call them again after seven days then 15 days and three months that the heart blood pressure and other parameters are returning to normal always this is a right time for the counseling so this is right time of counseling so you always say that this patient this is time that they can have adopt the positive life intervention because pregnancy test there capacity to develop hypertension so these patients are prone to develop preeclampsia next pregnancy all related complication as well as the hypertension in later period of their life so low salt diet exercise optimizing weight this is very important which as an obstetrician gynecologist can consider and always ask them to have a regular blood pressure check and if it is high bp then consultation with the physician so as an obstetrician gynecologist in preeclampsia, short term, long term, obstetrical disease, antihypertensive, dry dose of antihypertensive, anti seizure prophylaxis is important. But this is also opportunity to have the positive and the preventive intervention in their future adult life because we can play a big role in preventing the non-communicable disease in gen next generation as well as generation of mother and with this I thank you very much for patient listening and I seek that everybody should be there with my Foxy presidential election as well. Thank you very much.